questions and everything. Um, I'm Erin, I'm one of the officers here. We have Mark's here today. He is a 2004 SI alum, so he's one of us steps out in the working world. Um, and he is the digital archivist at Yale University. Mm -hmm. And he's been working on archive space, which is going to be the big new thing, uh, which if I'm if I understand it correctly, it's going to be kind of a compilation of Archivist's Toolkit and Archon. Yeah, it's it's a new application that com combines both, well, combines features, but it's going to be, my our goal is to make it better than both Archivist's Toolkit and Archon, so. So anyways, he's yeah. the person you want to talk to about that, but he's here today, he's going to be talking about using open source tools for digital forensics, particularly talking about accessioning collections, so we're really glad to have him here. Thank you very much. Sure. Take it away. Um, so uh, I just want to start and say um, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation. Um, so if you if anything comes up, feel free to raise your hand or just let me know. Um, but I'm hoping to leave some time at the end for questions as well. So, so what we're going to do is uh, we're basically going to go through what digital forensics it is um, and give some background about why we're choosing digital forensics to work with digital archival material. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, how we're going to use these tools and how, we go how are we going to use these methodologies. Uh, we're going to do um, a technical overview on storage. Um, so some of this you may know already, some of it you might not, but some some basically some some details about uh, the construction of, of computer media, um, how signals get encoded, and sort of the notion of how storage systems, like any other technology, use layers of abs abstraction. Uh, we're also going to talk about different things like file systems um, and uh, partition systems, basically how data gets expressed on storage. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, a brief walkthrough of some of the tools in terms of uh, what the tools do, how they map to these different layers that we're going to be talking about, and then uh, we're going to have an opportunity to work with the, the tools hands-on. So um, Aaron should have given you the, the information about uh, the downloads that you need. Um, if you were having trouble getting uh, VirtualBox up and running, uh, we may have a little time to do that today, but um, uh, if, if you're having issues, and just either let me know or find somebody to work with. So what we're not covering today, um, a lot of these are really relate to more logistical concerns than anything else and sort of the amount of time that we have. Uh, digital forensics is a pretty broad topic. And so with 90 minutes, including time for hands-on demo, um, I don't really have time to walk through everything. Uh, I, I'd say the biggest gap that we're going to not be able to talk about today is, is, is disk imaging in terms of doing things hands-on. Um, we're going to talk more about what disk imaging is if you don't know what it is, so don't worry about that. We're not really going to talk specifically about how we're going to use these tools to process, arrange, or describe materials. Uh, Again, part of that is, you know, I, I, I want you to get more information about these tools and think about how, how, uh, how you can apply them to do accessioning or gathering data that you might repurpose um, for some other purpose, like descriptive metadata, um, contextual information, and so forth. Um, we're not going to talk about how to aggregate this data, which I, I think is related to that last point. But I'm happy to discuss um, how we might do this. I'm happy to discuss how we do these things at Yale in particular. But we're, we're not going to focus on that too much. So what's digital forensics? Um, it's a branch of forensic science that encompasses the recovery, investigation, uh, in recovery and investigation of material on digital devices, including computers, mobile phones, and more. Um, Matthew Kirschenbaum, Richard Avenden, and, and Gabrielle Redwine uh, described digital forensics in their 2010 CLEAR report um, it, as it's considered it to be part of 
the branch of forensic science no, that analyzes trace evidence. Uh, the work on trace evidence is based on the work of the early forensic scientist Edmund Lacard, who developed something called the exchange principle. The exchange principle is a dictum states, that states that every contact leaves a trace. And so as, for example, if you, you, know, if you touch an item with your bare hands, you're going to leave a fingerprint. Um, any sort of interaction between two physical surfaces is, is going to make a change to those physical surfaces. So the idea with, with digital forensics is that the exchange principle applies to the interaction of, of uh, technologies, applies to the interaction of digital information in the same way it does for physical evidence. Um, McCamish identifies digital forensics as the process of identifying, preserving, analyzing, and presenting digital evidence in a manner that is legally acceptable. Um, in particular, digital forensics allows us to identify information and investigate issues regarding the state of digital information and the in events that impact it. Um, the, the type of evidence that we're thinking about really depends on the context. Um, in this case, digital forensics is often applied by law enforcement, so they're trying to uh, create, they're trying to build a case with, with specific points of evidence. So they um, basically, you're searching for, you, you have a hypothesis of, of what might have happened. Um, you search for evidence that will either uh, support or discredit that hypothesis and then basically describe that. Or, or you aggregate that in some way. Um, so the, the best overview um, for the cultural heritage sector is this 2010 CLEAR report. Um, there's a citation slide at the end, uh, and I'm happy to make my slides available. Um, there, are, there are links in there as well. Um, a lot of uh, important work has happened in digital forensics in the cultural heritage sector within the last three years or so. Uh, this includes the Ames Project, um, which is Born Digital uh, Collections and Inter-Institutional Model for Stewardship. This was an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded project that uh, Stanford University, Yale University, University of Virginia, and University of Hull participated in. Um, I was a digital archivist on the Ames Project for about my first year and a half at, at, uh, at Yale. Um, a lot of the work that I've done on digital forensics um, came about because of my work on Ames. Um, but we were really heavily influenced at first by the work that uh, was done at, the Stanford, at Stanford University. Uh, two people in particular, Michael Olson and Peter Chan, worked pretty heavily on their, their setup. So um, they really invested in sort of the, sort of the, what I'm calling like the full scale uh, forensic setup, which is a, a really specialized workstation, um, really expensive proprietary software, and so forth. Um, I also want to acknowledge the work of uh, Seamus Ross and, and Anne Gao. Um, they had a report that came out in 1999 called Digital Archaeology. Um, and basically that is a good overview of sort of the physical aspects of, of, of uh, computer media and how, how you can do essentially data recovery at a really, really low level. Um, I also want to acknowledge the work of the Digital Records Forensics Project at University of British Columbia. Um, this work is much more theoretical and um, focuses on uh, the consideration of applying forensic me methodology to support record keeping. So we're focusing more on technology today, but the, you know, I, I definitely look at the work that the, the folks at UBC are doing because it's, it's really interesting. So digital forensics has several subfields. Um, in some cases, they're dependent on the tools and th the techniques of others. So uh, we're primarily going to be looking at something called file system forensics today. Um, and it relates to the static data that's stored on some sort of medium or device, including hard drives, removable media, and so forth. Um, incident response concerns the work of first responders who gather evidence from the, the scene of a crime or another event. Intrusion detection is mostly situated within system administration uh, and computer security and, and focuses on what we're calling the analysis of live operational systems. 
Mobile device forensics should be pretty obvious. Um, it relates to the analysis of data and use of cell phones, tablets, PDAs, and other what I'm calling s small devices. Um, in part, the, the main distinction between mobile device forensics and file system forensics is, at least with some mobile devices, they use uh, slightly different types of file systems or slightly different types of technology. Uh, more recent uh, mobile phones, such as, like, if you have a smartphone or if you have a, a PDA or an iPad, a lot of the same, same, um, same tools uh, we use for file systems forensics might be useful, but if you're looking at sort of a traditional cell phone, it might be a little bit more, it, it might be somewhat different. Um, network forensics concerns the monitoring analysis of computer network traffic. Um, this is uh, definitely sort of out of scope for our discussion today, but there are a lot of really interesting things going on with network uh, forensics. Uh, it's often combi uh, done in combination with incident res response and intrusion detection. And database forensics relates to the forensic study of databases and their related metadata to investigate changes to data or transactions within them. So for example, if a lot of data forensics work, uh, database forensics work um, investigates whether transactions might be falsified in cases of fraud and so forth. So I want to talk a little bit more about the motivation. So as archivists, we understand how to get from an unorganized uh, aggregation of materials into something that we think is organ organized. Uh, we have a standardized set of procedures. We, you know, we have requirements for accessioning. We know how to process the materials. And it's very easy to get in an, to be able to analyze a large swath of material by doing, you know, by doing things like sampling and things like that. It's a very, you know, it's definitely an intellectual process, but it's, it's certainly visual. You know, if you're working in the field and you're trying to appraise something, um, if you have some knowledge of the subject, you can make a fairly educated guess whether those materials will be worth something by, by looking at them. You know, you might spend a, an hour with a donor looking at, you know, a 50 box collection and picking out which ones, you, or picking out the majority of, of which you'll find your repository will be most use, find most youth, excuse me, find most useful. And so my point is, should these be any different? I don't, and my assumption is no. Um, these are uh, pieces of media in our collection at Yale. Um, we've got data tapes. We've got you know three different kinds of floppy disks, zip disks, optical media, hard drives, and occasionally full systems. So part of the issue that we're having is there's a, this conceptual gap between being able to understand how to do the same sort of analysis with digital materials that you are you're able to do with physical materials. So. In my opinion, I, I think digital forensics gives us a lot of opportunity to think about how to apply, to apply some of these um, procedures in, a, in definitely, I think, a much more methodical way and in a way that uh, allows us to make fairly educated assumptions about what the material is or how it's used. So in, in terms of why we might choose digital forensics, the, the, the first reason I, th I find the most compelling, it's an established discipline um, that really focuses on clear ideas such as chain of custody. You know, there, there are legal requirements for forensic process. There's an established, it's an established discipline that has legal requirements and best practices. Um, there are certifications for, for forensic examiners and so forth. It demands the holistic capture and preservation of evidence. So the assumption is you're just going to collect as much as possible, but then be able to do some analysis to figure out what is relevant and what's not relevant. Archives are faced with this growing mass of digital information um, that is hard to appraise in the field. We don't have a good way to make educated guesses in the same way that we do uh, with, with boxes of material. A lot of it's stored on removable media, so there's a risk of uh, the degradation of that media. There's also a really significant overlap in terms of the skills and knowledge um, applied in digital forensics. 
And there, there's definitely many potential opportunities for collaboration, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about um, the processes of forensic discovery. We're going to look at a couple of models. Um, this one is based on is a rendering of a model developed by Brian Carrier um, in his book, File System Forensic Analysis. And he identifies three phases that are, are linked and, and somewhat iterative. So these arrows that, that connect these, two, these boxes back and forth, um, so, you know, there, it allows you to go back and sort of iterate between these steps very nicely. The first phase in the investigation process is called the system preservation phase. And that's where we try to preserve the state of the materials re we receive. In terms of a forensic investigation that relates to a, a, the scene of a crime, we're, we're trying to preserve the state of that crime, of, of the crime scene, excuse me. The actions that, that are undertaken in the system preservation phase vary depending on the legal, business, or operational requirements of the investigation. And the purpose of the phase is to reduce the amount of evidence that might be overwritten. The process continues after the data has been acquired from the system because we need to preserve the data for future analysis. After we've taken steps to preserve the data, we need to search them for evidence. From the point of view of forensics, we're looking for data that, as I said before, that support or refute hypotheses about a particular incident. This process typically starts with a survey of common locations based on the type of incident, so if one is known. For example, in the case of a crime, if we're investigating something like web browsing habits, we'll look at something like the web browser's cache, the history file, and the bookmarks. But generally speaking, when we apply digital forensics to archives, we're looking to gather this information a little bit more broadly because we're not trying to build a case in the same way. Um, it may be useful here to consider some of the appraisal implications, though. Do we, for example, do we want to collect only that we know what that we're looking for? So if, for example, if you're talking to a particular donor and they say, I don't want you to collect my email or I, you know, I don't want you to recover uh, deleted files, you know, is, what are the ethical implications of saying, well, we're just going to get a forensic image of this person's entire computer? The other consideration is, well, do we want to try to collect things that we don't nece necessarily know that we're looking for? If we have a, a a donor who's being very who's very willing to sort of say, yeah, just take everything, you know, I understand the privacy implications. Uh, do we do we want to collect information that might be viewed as an outlier or you know that that may not be viewed as significant from a traditional appraisal context? I find it really interesting in this case that a lot of the the uh, use of digital forensics is focusing on the collections of, of uh, literary authors. And um, literary scholars in particular are very, very interested in getting this sort of broad swath of material. And so it, there, I, I think there's, there's definitely a potential to sort of figure out what's the most appropriate way to situate this in terms of the work that you're doing. The last phase in Carrier's model is uh, to use evidence that we found and develop and determine which events occurred in the system. Carrier's definition of investigation is that we're trying to answer questions about digital events. And so event reconstruction requires knowledge about the applications and the operating system that are installed in the system. So you can create these hypotheses based on their capabilities. So today we're going to be focusing primarily on the first two phases of, of, of this model. Uh, this is also a, a, another model that I find pretty useful, which is the uh, electronic discovery Re reference model stages, uh, or these, these stages from the electronic discovery reference model. Um, the EDRM is used for, uh, is uh, an abstract model used in e-discovery, for example, for, for, uh, for legal purposes. The, the three most important phases for our discussion that map nicely to um, the first two phases of, of Carrier's model that we looked at are the preservation, the collection, and the processing phases. In the preservation phase, um, we're aiming to 
promptly isolate and protect potentially relevant data in ways that are legally defensible, reasonable, proportionate, efficient, auditable, broad but tailored, and to mitigate risks. So one of the things that to note about the, the, the EDRM model is that throughout these phases, there's this notion that you should be able to uh, provide status and progress, um, provide documentation for a defensible audit trail, and continually do uh, quality control and validation. The collection phase in the EDRM model is uh, the acquisition of potentially relevant uh, electronic information as defined in the, the identification phase, which we, we didn't really talk about. But we, we can come back to that if you'd like. The exigencies of, of litigation, governmental in inquiries, and uh, internal investigations generally require this, uh, this digital information and associated metadata should be collected in a manner that is, again, legally defensible, efficient, audible, and targeted. So the process of collecting this information will generally provide feedback to the identification function, which may impact and expand the scope of the overall electronic discovery process. So again, this may, the, the information that you collect here may influence particular appraisal decisions that you make. So that's, uh, so again, it's important to, to note that a lot of this is really designed to be iterative. In the processing phase, uh, we're trying to perform actions on this digital information that allow for metadata preservation, itemization, normalization of format, and data re reduction via selection for review. So basically, we're trying to gather information and identify which is going to be relevant, which requires further analysis, and so forth. So as you can see here, there are several useful aspects of digital forensics for archives. We can gather provenance information about the context of creation and record that, in, pr that provenance information about, about the process of, processes of transfer and analysis. Um, <coughs> digital information requires us to think about provenance somewhat differently. We can uh, get information about the context of creation by embedded metadata. So for example, if the, the, in a Word document, there will be creator information. But there's a lot of additional provenance information that we should gather. So when we're acquiring digital information through a forensic process, we really need to document what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Gives us the opportunity to document original order, um, which is actually a very interesting topic of debate. Uh, in some cases, the arrangement of files is significant when you receive it. In other cases, it's not. Um, what we found at Yale is that the older that the material is, um, you know, for example, if we've gotten 50 or 100 boxes, or, sorry, 50 or 100 floppy disks in a particular accession, um, if, if it's an older accession, the, the association of the floppy disks to uh, aggregations of records is not always significant. But it, it, it does provide us a, a way to document how we received it. We can document and ensure the chain of custody through these proven transfer method, methods that maintain integrity and authenticity. And then it allows us to identify personally identifiable information and other material which might be sensitive. <coughs> so this is, um, this is an overview of a workflow model developed by Cam Woods, Cal Lee, and Simpson Garfinkel, um, which basically maps some of the processes of, uh, of uh, forensic, forensic information gathering to traditional archives processes. So the assumption here is that we're acquiring a disk image, which again, we'll talk a little bit more later. Um, we have a, a, basically a set of hardware and software to, in, to gather this representation directly off media that we can then store in a file. We have an ingest process that allows us to basically take that disk image file, uh, compress it if we'd like, add some additional technical metadata, add some metadata about the, the acquisi acquisition process, and store it in some sort of container format. And then we have an extraction process that allows us to 
document that imaging process, um, add additional information such as uh, inventory, checksums, um, and then package that in a way that becomes useful to us as archivists. This is a workflow model that we developed at Yale for the accessioning of, of media. Um, and so the assumption is that we've got a process uh, that allows us to provide essentially item level control during the accessioning process for each piece of media. Um, we can record identifying characteristics. Again, we create a disk image. We verify that image, um, gather some metadata, put it in storage, and then optionally do some additional analysis of the metadata that we've extracted. In terms of transfer, um, the goals are to, to obtain these records um, or files in a manner that doesn't threaten their in integrity or, or authenticity. And we want to understand the correspondence or gaps between what, what we're able to do and what we're not able to do. Um, or, or essentially, if, they're, if we're expected to do a particular thing and we can't, for whatever reason, we can't. So the, the means by which we do this really relates to preventing the accidental or intentional alteration of these assets. Um, in the case of digital information, we have these, these, these specific right protection mechanisms, which I'll talk about shortly. And we need, we need to document this process, as we've indicated before. And we, in particular, we want to document the process, particularly when we're doing things that are out of the ordinary. And, and so potentially this, this process can be recreated, recreated if need be. In terms of transfer options, um, we can perform something called disk imaging, which uh, we're, when we gather a disk image, we're essentially getting the, a raw representation of the bitstream on that media, including deleted files, errors, and so forth. And when we, t we go through the, the, uh, the technical part of the presentation, I'll be talking a little bit more what precisely that means. There's also a process called logical imaging, which means that we can select files if we can interpret the file system on that media instead of taking an, uh, this sort of lower level raw disk image. But again, we need to ensure that the files don't get altered regardless of the process. In terms of preventing accidental modification, um, we have a couple of options. One is called write protection, wherein some media formats have a, a physical means or, or limitations. So for example, floppies have, uh, floppy disks have, usually have some sort of tab or notch that, that you either cover or uncover to, to prevent the, the writing of that media. So the assumption is that the drive itself has, has a physical sensor that can determine the presence of that. Um, other types of media, such as CD-ROMs, are inher inherently read-only. Um, so the, the assumption there is that you know, there is no way to alter the data on that medium. We can also use something called write blocking, which uses hardware or a hardware or software mechanism to prevent write signals from being processed by the computer or the drive. So uh, in terms of what's the better option, software write blocking tends to not to work as well and tends not to be as reliable. So hardware write blocking is in, intentionally uh, is much more preferred in this case. So this is just an example of uh, different write protection mechanisms. So on the left, you can see a five and a quarter floppy drive. There's the write protect notch on the right hand side. And uh, if you cover that notch with a sticker, the, the, the drive will prevent you from writing to it. On the left hand side is a USB key that's got a switch which just essentially sends, uh, sends a signal to the flash media saying that you can't write. In terms of hardware write blocking, uh, this is an example of a write blocker. Um, basically, it's a piece of hardware that sits between uh, the computer and whatever media that you're using. 
So in this case, this is a, this, this is a hard drive, and the write blocker would connect directly to the computer using USB. In terms of documentation, um, at least in our process at Yale, we, we wanted to identify and record characteristics of media. Um, we wanted to provide each piece of media with a unique identifier. We wanted to record physical information about that media, such, um, such as its format, it, any sort of label information, and, and so forth. We want to document the transfer process, as I said before, and ideally, um, gather information about the, about the assets on that media. At Yale, we have a, a database called our um, media log, which provides us the capacity to create a unique entry for each piece of media in an accession. So we assign an identifier uh, to, to each piece of media, and um, we can record additional information. So this is just a detailed view. Um, in this case, you can see the media number, the format, um, the density, um, the, the label text, a, a, any additional information, such as the manufacturer, who did the imaging, whether the imaging was successful, the file name for the image, and so forth. For example, uh, this is a, 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 an interesting case uh, where we were working with a, a CD-ROM and I, we couldn't extract the metadata using the, the traditional process that we used. And we, we performed some additional analysis and realized that it was, the CD was written in a particular, uh, particular way that the software that we were using to do the metadata extraction didn't support at the time. In terms of uh, the, our goals for extracting and analyzing data, um, we want to be able to repurpose this metadata. So, if, uh, so for example, in, in an accession, you might have, uh, you, you might be used to working with an, an inventory of materials. So we can have a similar construct when we're working with digital materials. We can have a listing of files with modification dates and extents. Um, we can gather some additional technical information, such as the file format, the software used, um, and provide context. So, so extracting additional metadata from the files themselves, such as, you know, were they associated with a particular user account? Um, you know, how did people collaborate and so forth? Repurposing might mean, in some cases, translation into standards used by ar archives and libraries. So there are a couple of different options in terms of um, the types of output that we see. There are, there are some emerging standards in the digital, digital forensics sector. But they're, they, they're not used by libraries and archives, essentially. So you, there, there is this, there's a growing opportunity to think about what, what sort of information is most useful in term, and how it maps to existing standards. We might also want to extract uh, and migrate files on the, that media, so, or within the disk image. So the assumption is that when you have a disk image, you know, you may not, it may be sort of difficult to work with, at least from a user perspective. So in order to preserve these as records or preserve them as file assets, you want to do this additional step where, down the line, where you take the files out of the image and perform whatever preservation actions that you want on, on these files. In terms of using open source digital forensics, um, I, I think there's, there is a, a big motivation here for, for us at Yale. Um, in terms of a, a lot of forensic software and hardware is very, very expensive. Um, the cultural heritage se sector is really an emerging market for digital forensics vendors. They haven't been terribly responsive in part because we are such a small market for them. Um, open source as such allows for better collaboration and and in particular, less dependence on, on particular companies or individuals. Um, the the digital for, open source digital forensic, forensics community is pretty vibrant, and a lot of these tools are under pretty heavy development. That doesn't mean these tools are not stable, but the, there, there is the potential to work much more closely with vendors and digital forensics experts who, who work with these open source tools. 
From the standpoint of accountability, um, I think the transparency of design and implementation of open source software allows for a better understanding of impact on, on authenticity. And as I said before, because it's open source, we have the potential to shape the future for the software. So part of that is you, you'll, you may hear that open source is, is free. And, but it's not, so there, there's sort of two notions of free. There's free as in beer, and there's free as in kittens. And then there's, there's, there's free in terms of speech. So a lot of people say that open source is free as in speech. You're allowed to do with it whatever you want. So obviously in this case, this, this, is, this is true for us. We discovered digital, open source digital forensics software, and we had the opportunity to work with, you know, to work on our own and explore things and do some additional development to, to try this out. But open source is also free as in kittens. You have to feed the kitten, you have to take care of the kitten, you have to give the kitten shots. So participating in an open source community really sort of requires you to step up and think about you know, what, what might you contrib contrib uh, contribute to the community. We haven't done a lot in terms of contribution. We, we've shared a lot of what we've done already in terms of some, some additional development and integration work. And we've had some very, very, very preliminary talks with some open source digital forensics vendors about adding additional functionality that we would then re release to the rest of the, the, the community as, uh, as open source. So let's, let's talk, uh, this is going to be the more technical part of the talk. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about um, how storage and physical media work and sort of the implications for forensic analysis. So digital objects are, are complex. Um, they require mediation as and as anything that relate, requires on, on technology. And there are many, many factors that need to work together um, for a digital object to be interpreted or a digital object to be rendered. Um, digital objects also depend on, on the layers of abstraction, such as, uh, you know, there's this, this thing called the OSI model for computer networking, where you have this notion of this, this physical layer and different layers of protocols on top, it, on top of it. Can, Thibodeau's notion of a, a, a three-part model for digital objects I find is really, really useful here. There's a notion of a physical object in case of, digital, of a digital object. Um, digital objects are always stored on some sort of media. Um, even if you consider, you know, you're thinking about cloud storage, it's on a server somewhere. It, it's not, you know, it's not in, st stored in some void. It's, it's on a physical server. There are logical objects um, which, uh, the computer interacts with, so at the level of files and at the level of, of other things that we're going to be looking at shortly. And then there's a the notion of the conceptual object, which is what we work with. So, you know, we have, you know, we may work with a file which turns out to be a Microsoft Word file, but it's, you know, it's a report. The, the report is a conceptual object. There are different levels of representation, and this was adapted from um, a presentation done by Cal Lee at um, the ICA conference this August. And so th the levels of representation go from essentially the, the most raw at the bottom all the way to the top. So at level zero, we have a, a, signal, uh, a signal on a physical medium. So all, me all computer media require a, a, rely on some sort of physical properties of that medium to, to encode an analog signal. So we'll talk a, a little bit more about specifics in, in terms of how that works shortly. Um, there's the, a raw signal stream through, through input and output equipment. So that, that stream, of, of, anal that stream of, of analog information that's uh, stored on that medium is then interpreted into an analog uh, uh, electro, uh, electronic signal that has not been interpreted into bit streams. The next level up is the bit stream through the I.O. equipment. It's the, the actual ones and zeros as accessed and decoded using a particular set of algorithms. Um, we have this notion of, of chunks of data above that. 
uh, individual files as raw bit streams uh, um, that are stored as continuous binary values. Uh, files encountered as discrete sets of items with associated metadata, such as paths, file names, and so forth. Um, the, app, the, the file as rendered in a specific application, a notion of, of objects which comprise multiple files, and, and aggregations of objects that can focus on even higher level conceptual objects um, that we talked about before. This is a representation of storage hierarchy in computers. Um, at the top are very, very fast and very expensive storage areas. So essentially, at the top, you have this level of, um, the, the storage hierarchy at the top is storage that is essentially immediately used by the computer. It's, it lives both physically and virtually close to the processor. Um, so you have registers in the processor itself, itself which store values. Um, and the processor cache. The next level down re requires the computer to be on, but are, are short term, they're, they're fast, um, but they're not persistent. So you have data in, in, in RAM on your computer. The next level down um, are uh, removable, uh, removable media that allows you to, to store things with a power off. So example, uh, flash drives, USB memory, CDs, floppy disks, etc. You have uh, sort of longer term, um, larger blocks of storage such as hard drives, and at the bottom, um, very long term, very persistent types of storage such as tape backup. So what we're going to be talking about today is most is mostly the second half, second bottom half, or sorry. The bottom half of this this pyramid, in particular, this the sort of the the fourth and fifth levels down. In terms of the layers of forensic analysis, this is a model developed by again by Brian Carrier, and so right now, um, again, as you can see here, there's there's a this hierarchy of relationships between the media itself something that we're calling volumes, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, um, the file system, and, and the applications. So these are, again, sort of levels of aggregation that require different, uh, different processes of interpretation. In terms of uh, physical media and signals, um, floppy disks and hard drives record, use changes in something called uh, magnetic flux that are encoded and decoded using a particular algorithm. So there's a, there's a, a number of algorithms, and in many cases, um, a, a lot of this interpretation happens at the level of, an inter for, of the interface card to that drive. So for example, for hard drives, this often happen, happens on, on, there's a card itself connected to your hard drive. If, so if you have a physical hard drive, there's this card underneath. That, that, that does the sort of the minimum level of signal processing itself. Um, there are many encoding schemes, um, and depending on the type of controller card, uh, it, it may not, they may not always be interpretable depending on the type of controller card that you have. So for example, with some types of floppy media, you might find if you have, you know, say you have a three and a half inch floppy drive, um, and you have a, a disk, like a, a double density three and a half inch disk from uh, a Macintosh. That disk was written using a particular encoding scheme that is not typically interpretable by um, something like a USB floppy drive or a floppy drive in a PC. It requires a different level, a, a, a different set of, of decoding instructions. Optical media use physically a physically altered substrate. Um, in the case of CDRs, there's a particular dye that's responsive to lasers. Um, with these things called pits and lands that determine the reflectivity of, of light shown on them. Um, again, these are encoded and decoded using series of a series of algorithms. Flash memory is um, not. I'm I'm definitely oversimplifying it here but it uses stored amounts of electric charge to determine uh, how data is stored. So in, in, 
in looking at storage, it's useful to think about, uh, particularly with um, magnetic media, something called disk geometry. So basically, there, the, the disk ge geometry is, um, is really useful when thinking about computers because the, the computer processor has to manipulate data in the form of bit streams. Moving data from, the hard, from a hard drive, for example, from, to the processor depends on higher level groupings. And geometry is a way to provide addressing information for the location of data on that media. <coughs> Sectors are the smallest unit that can be addressed at a low level by the computer. And uh, depending on the type of storage and system in use, um, they have a specified size. Sectors are defined by low-level formatting, which, require, which defines the required ge geometry in a given context. Um, something called a data unit, um, in some cases it's called a cluster or a block, is a small grouping of sectors that can be addressed by a given operating system. And these vary in size depending on uh, operating system type and the size of the storage device. So in this case, in the bottom image, we're looking at a, a, a essentially a view of a, a hard drive and the notion is that we've got um, we've got eight heads that so four platters and eight heads. Um, each platter has uh, has two heads essentially. So any any sort of um, magnetic disc uh, will have a head on the top and the head on the bottom. So this also includes um, floppy media, for example. So uh, what's disk imaging? Um, it's a process that runs through the levels of representation 0 through 2 that we looked at before. And it uses a drive to acquire these analog signals that are stored in, you know, on a, a physical medium. Those analog signal, signals become analog electrical signals. Um, and hardware and software interprets those electrical signals into a bit stream using one or more algorithms. So for example, this is a screenshot of, uh, of the disk imaging application for a particular piece of hardware called a cryoflux. So a cryoflux is, is a, a very, very specialized floppy disk controller that um, rather than letting the controller card itself do the interpretation and do the decoding using a series of algorithms, the software does it. So the assumption is here that if we have a piece of media, um, we can... Um, we can do essentially, uh, if we weren't able to interpret the, those signals themselves using a, using a traditional floppy drive controller, we can get that data here. In this case, this is a, um, a single-sided disk. So you see, so the side zero, that's just one of the two heads for the disk. Uh, on the right-hand side is a rep representation of that signal on this disk. So the software has decoded this using a particular algorithm. There's a number of disk image formats. Um, there's uh, raw images, which we use, um, a number of different container formats that allow embedded metadata, and so forth. So um, the next level up, once we have a bitstream, is we can do some volume analysis, which is um, volumes are defined as the, the collection of addressable sector, uh, sectors usable for storage. Uh, the sectors in a volume don't necessarily need to be consecutive on a physical storage device. Instead, the computer only needs the impression that they are. Uh, and har a hard disk, for example, is uh, a volume that's located in consecutive sectors. And it might be the result of assembling and merging smaller volumes. A partition is a collection of consecutive sectors in a volume. And by definition, a partition is also a volume, which is, which is a little confusing. Partitions are, are also used in many scenarios, including compensations for limitations on maximum file size to, impact the, to minimize the impact of file system corruption or to store different operating systems on a computer. A partition map is a, a metadata structure that describes a layout of partitions in the volume, and which we'll look at shortly. And there are a number of different partition formats. By far, probably the ones that you'll, you'll be working with the most are DOS, GPT, and Apple partition maps. 
Not all media use partitions, however, um, in particular a lot of removable media, so it's much more common with hard drives. This is an example of the organization of partitions. This is, so this is a particularly complex one where there are six partitions on a, on a, a given drive. Um, the sort of the, the narrow vertical columns represent the partition maps. And so there are particular, depending on the partition system, there might be a limit to the number of partitions that each can map to, requiring nesting as shown here. So once we interpret the volume system and have access to the volumes, we can perform some file system analysis. File systems are a mechanism to store data in, ser in a series of files and, and directories with associated information or metadata about those uh, using a unified set of procedures. So the assumption with a file system is that it pro essentially provides either some sort of de facto standard or specification for, for accessing those files. Um, the model that we're going to be looking at today uh, separates information and content into layers or categories. This is Carrier's representation of the different file system data categories. Um, there's something called the file system category, which contains the general file system information. Um, all, sy all file systems have a general structure to them, but each is an instance of a file system. Uh, each, but each is instance of a file system is unique because it has a unique size and can be tuned for, for performance. Data in the file system category might tell you where to find certain data structures and how big each, each data unit is. You can think of this, data, this category as a map for a specific file system. The content category contains the data that comprise the actual content of the file, which is the reason why we have file systems in the first place. Most of the data in a file system belong to this category, and it's, file systems are typically organized into a collection of standard size containers. Each file system assigns a different name to the containers, such as clusters or blocks, but in this case we're just going to call them data units. Working with a content category allows you, to, allow, allows you raw access to underlying data units, even when other layers say they're uh, unallocated or unused. The metadata category contains the data that describe the file. Um, this category contains information, such as where the file content is stored, how big the file is, times and dates when the file was last read from or written to, and access control information. This category doesn't contain the, the content of the file, and it may not contain the name of the file. Uh, a metadata category can help you recover deleted files and gain access to something called slack space. And slack space is what occurs when the size of the file is not a multiple of the, the data size. Um, so a file system must a, a file uh, a file on a file system must allocate a full data unit, even if it only uses uses a small part of it. And the unused bytes in this data are called slack space. For example, if you have a file that's 100 bytes long. It needs to allocate a full 2,048-byte data unit on a particular kind of file system. So the final um, 1,948 bytes would be slack space. Depending on the system, they might be filled with null characters or contain fragments of the data stored in the computer's RAM. The file name category, um, or also called the human interface category, contains the data that uh, assign a name to each file. In most file systems, these data are located in the contents of the directory and are a list of file names with the corresponding metadata address. With the metadata category, sometimes the file name category can help you recover deleted files as well. The application category contains data that provides special features, um, and these data are not used necessarily when, it, it, these data are not needed in the process of reading or writing a file, and in many cases don't need to be included in the file system specification. So there are a number of file system types, um, FAT, NTFS, HFS+, and ISO 9660 are probably the ones that you're going to see the most. Um, X2, X3, and X4 are used by Linux systems, but there are many, many others. So um, once we have access to files, uh, we can perform what's called application level analysis. So application level analysis is what you typically think of when, in terms of working with files. It can include things like file format identification, um, doing what's called carving, which is a specific method of data recovery that using uh, particular file signatures. You can calculate checksums or verify those checksums. You can search for other kinds of data. 
um, such as personally identifiable information um, or perform virus checking. So now I'm just going to do a brief overview of some of the tools. Um, I'm going to probably speed through this so we have some time to do the, the hands-on demo. Um, so uh, the Big Curator Project is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and the partners are the School of Information Library Science at, at UNC and the Maryland Institute for, uh, for Technology and Humanities. So Big Curator is developing a system um, for use by archives, libraries, and museums that incorporates a lot of functionality of these tools into a common environment. So part of the issue with a lot of these tools in particular is they're, they're somewhat hard to use or somewhat hard to install. So the idea with Big Curator is um, the, they'll essentially be pre-installed in an environment that you can run on your computer. It's still very much under development, but so what, you're what we're going to be looking at today is a very early preview release. Uh, Guyimager is the disk imaging software that's packaged with uh, the BitCurator project. Uh, it's open source. Um, it supports multiple imaging formats, uh, such as uh, RAW, the NCASE E01 format, and AFF. E01 and AFF are the two, um, the two formats that, su that support embedded metadata. And it, it allows you to e enter some basic metadata and, and calculate checksums to, uh, and verify those checksums once you've imaged the media. So this is just a, a screenshot of, of Guyimager. As you can see, I'm looking at uh, the imaging of a particular hard disk here. Um, and you can see the form which allows you to enter additional metadata. The Sleuth Kit is an open source library um, which provides some command line tools and a GUI application called Autopsy. Um, it allows you to do forensic analysis. Um, it supports the analysis of a number of different kinds of file systems, um, most of which are pretty common. Um, but there, there are some gaps, particularly if you're dealing with older me media, you may not be able to use Sleuth Kit. Uh, it's, it splits the tools into layers that we saw before. So there, there are tools to work with the volume system, um, file system, the file name layer, the metadata layer, and the data unit layer. And there, it also provides some additional tools to, to work with the data. Uh, that, that you've extracted. So there are a couple of image file tools. Um, as you'll see, there's, there, the names of the, the tools are, are pretty consistent across the different la layers. So any tool that ends in stat provides you information about, about, about whatever you're looking at. And the cat uh, tool, uh, tools allow you to get the entire content of whatever layer you're operating on. There are tools at the volume system layer. Um, tools with a, the name LS provide in, information about the layout. So for example, if you're looking at the, the file name layer in particular, you can get a listing of the allocated and unallocated file name entries. There are also tools that operate at the metadata layer. Um, and we're not going to be looking at them today because they're a little bit too low level for what we're working with. But there are tools that also operate at the data unit layer. The additional uh, tools um, allow us to extract metadata into a SQLite database, um, which allows us to, to uh, post-process using um, any number of programming languages. There's a script which allows us to extract allocated or unallocated files from a disk image. Um, we can create something called a timeline, which aggregates information uh, about the modification, access, and, and creation dates. And a tool called Sorter, which sorts files based on file type. <coughs> uh, FileWalk is a command line program, which depends on the Sleuth Kit. Um, it outputs results in, mul in multiple formats, but the one that I find most useful is called Digital Forensics XML. And it was developed to support automated forensic processing. Um, part of the issue with doing a lot of work with, with tools like SleuthKit is that it requires a, a lot of hands-on work at all these different levels. So with FiWalk, um, you essentially can make one, one pass with FiWalk and extract the data into a way that's easily repurposable. You can create plugins to perform application-level analysis when you're doing the data extraction. 
And it's, as I said before, it's, it's much, much faster. So digital forensics XML is a, a representation of uh, structured forensic information um, developed by somebody named Simpson Garfinkel from the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, it's really easy to add additional information to DFXML. The, the standards are really, really flexible. And it's very easy to process. Um, the, with with FIWALK, uh, a number of tools have been, pre, uh, have been packaged to allow you to do uh, analysis of that data. Bulk Extractor is uh, another tool that I think you'll find really, really useful. I, I've only really started just using it recently. But it performs something called bulk data analysis. Rather than um, gathering information about the file system and sort of going through the levels, it, it treats a disk image as, as a raw bit stream and just goes through everything in one pass and doesn't analyze the individual files. It allows you to um, find patterns of information of interest, so things like email addresses, URLs, PDF files, um, GPS coordinates, um, and so forth. And it's really good for identifying potential uh, issues of personally, personally identifiable information. So this is a screenshot of, of the program called BE Viewer, which um, is, allows you to specify which scanners that you're, you're using over on the right-hand side. And this is just sort of a, a view of those tools. And so in this case, I, I'm looking at the output of uh, the, the pattern matching of email on a particular disk image. So in this case, rather than referring to a particular uh, file on the disk image, if you see on the right-hand side, you see something called the feature path. That is the reference to the particular location in the, in the byte stream for, for, uh, for that data. So you, you, you can use additional tools such, such as the ones provided by SleuthKit to, to figure out which file that data is actually exists in, but that's not going to happen at, at this level within bulk, with Bulk Extractor. 